Okay. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Achieve More podcast. I am Anthony from Pittsburgh. Uh, if you'd like to see the um, video version of this podcast, you can come over to Pittsburgh. That's where it's going to be uploaded. Uh, you can also find vlogs there that I do with my girlfriend where we travel and go fun places. Uh, also, my co-host, Michael, over at Huddle Card Collection. How are you doing today, brother? Great, Anthony. How are you doing, pal? Can't complain, man. Uh, anything Thanks, new and on. exciting happening with you over there at Huddle Card? Yeah, you know, so you know, we got the podcast Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. Please, think, you know, come on over. I don't. This podcast is all only on YouTube. It's not, you know, on your uh, your podcast website. So come over to Huddle Card Collection, uh, you know, on the YouTube and uh, check us out Wednesday nights. Sounds good. Yeah, he does a great job. He has some great industry uh, experts come in in the sports card space so if you guys are into collectibles check out huddle card collection without further ado today we have a special guest on the program um, a gentleman who has had a career in the entertainment field um, we have Cy Young with us uh, Cy if you could just uh, briefly uh, you know, introduce yourself and anything you'd like to share with the audience sure my name is Cy Young I um, I started off playing the trumpet when I was a kid to help my eyes uh, man breathing problem. And then I got to, that was the very first thing I did. And then I got to Chicago. I went to Chicago and I studied ballet and tap dancing and acrobatics. And I wanted to be a dancer and a singer. I actually wanted to be like Gene Kelly. And I, I realized that I should be just going by myself, work by myself and not somebody else. So anyway, I, um, I got a job. My first job was in Chicago at the Empire Room of the Palmer House. Uh, and uh, we were in a little group um, called the Merrill Abbott Dancers. There were two guys and, and and six women. And I really liked those odds. They were really great for me. So anyway, um, <laughs> it was fun. I look around and I could see all these legs and things. But anyway, we, we got a job going out to California to open the Beverly Hilton Hotel, believe it or not, in the 50s, and sometime in the 50s. And we did a show there. And then we came back and I was in the Empire Room of the Palmer House for six months working there and uh, doing uh, in the show where people like Harry Belafonte would come and we would do a show with them and we would do the dancing. Well, about um, I, about six months later, uh, a show called Pajama Game, which you probably know, came to town. It was a big town. With, it was a big show with Fran Warren. And they were getting and They were replacing their Steam Heat boys. They had three boys. Did you ever see, Steam, never see the uh, Pajama Game show? No, I have not. Okay. Well, there was a number in it, big, big number staged the opening of act two with bob fossey called steam heat and it was a very famous number and they were losing one of the boys so they came down to see me and uh, to see me and hired me and i got the job and i was so i opened and bob fossey was very upset because he wanted to get somebody from new york but i was too good he couldn't fuck me so <laughs> I, stayed with, I stayed with the show for about uh, about 11 12 months about, about a year i was out and i got to new york and uh, when I got to New York, I started doing all kinds of stuff at the Cherry Lane and singing and doing things. And um, I got uh, I got into a, a club called the Upstairs at the Downstairs, which was very famous in New York on East 56th Street, just off of Fifth Avenue, off of uh, Sixth Avenue. And uh, it was a they would do a little show downstairs with a little tiny cat, little tiny uh, curtain uh, apron, and then they would do one upstairs with a little tiny place. And um, so I got to be pretty, pretty solid there. About three years I worked there. And it was great because everybody in New York came to see the show. And I, so I got, I got very well known. And uh, for instance, uh, Carol, what's her name, Carol Lee? The very famous Carol, you don't even know who I am, uh, that, who does all the stuff on television. Carol oh, Burnett. Burnett. Yeah. She came to see the show and she said, sigh. I liked everything you did. Call me. She gave me <laughs> a letter. I didn't <laughs> call her. <laughs> so, <laughs> da, da, da. Anyway, and so and, and then also uh, um, Barbara Streisand came to see the show uh, with her then boyfriend, who was a big tall guy, whatever his name was. And uh, a little bit later, she was doing. Um, she came to New York, and she was auditioning writers to get songs for her for an album the uh, third album and uh so i, I was there about, about eight or nine of us and i did a couple of songs i did this one song called draw me a circle very simple little song 
And uh, she said, oh, I love that song. What is, and, and she said, I'll have Marty call you. Marty Ehrlichman was her manager. Well, man, he didn't call me for six months. And I did something really stupid. I let someone else sing it. And uh, that was okay. But she still, the Barbara still put it in her album. And she used it uh, for opening one of her series, one of her television shows, which is very, very exciting. That's awesome. Anyway, I did that. And then I did a lot of shows. I did uh, work with, um, as, I say, as you know, I worked with Buster. I worked with a guy named Howard Keel in his show down in Florida, where I stopped the show on a clear day. On a clear day. Oh, it was, yeah, that's a song. I still sing, by the way. Uh, but anyway, I did that show. And um, then uh, I was out with uh, a, a different shows from time to time. And I got, uh, got really into the whole thing of, of writing. And um, I had three plays published by Samuel French. And I had three musicals produced off-Broadway at Theater 4, and which is right around where the corner from where I lived, the 57th Street. And um, I had, had those things done. And um, it was really exciting. And now I'm working right now on a musical called The Children's Crusade. By 12 year 12 12 have you ever heard of that i i did look into it as i was doing some research to you know for you coming on but um i hadn't been familiar with it before that yeah it was it's a wonderful show and i'm working on uh, raising money for that and i have something called a trip deck uh, i think it's called a trip deck and it's got all the story and the, the lie and this and everything out there but uh, there were a couple of things about buster that I, I wanted to mention to you too, which is, which is Buster. I don't know if you know anything about Keaton, but if you yeah, really tell us a little bit about him, um, especially for those people that are listening that might not be familiar with him, uh, tell us about you know you working with him and um, you know just kind of like who he is and you know what what he meant, you know, not Buster only to you Keaton, but to uh, the yeah, industry. Was uh, uh, along with Charlie Chaplin. But the two great film stars in the, in the in the turn of the century, up until like like nineteen twenty or something, twenty thirty, and um, Buster was very well known for his pantomime, and he was he's known as the the best stuntman who ever lived. Now you can go you can do this right now. Anyone can go to go to online and pull up Buster Keaton's stunts, and you will be amazed at what he did. He could just do anything. He could be hanging from a clock way up high, you know, on a building and all that. And he also, he, he broke his neck once. And uh, a, year, a year later, he didn't know it. A year later, the doctor said, hey, Buster, when did you break your neck? He said, what? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't bother him because he was so, so physical. He was just so trained to fall and that sort of thing. It was a, it was a great thing. And um, so he did a great, uh, he did a wonderful thing with that. And uh, he... Um, he was, um, he said the way he broke his fall, the way he keeps from hurting himself was by hitting, when he would hit a wall, so he'd use his hand or his foot to break the fall. He said, if I didn't do that, I could have been killed a couple of times. So he learned that technique when he was doing vaudeville, and it, it stood, stood him in really good stead from then on when he did other things. Now, he knew of, he knew of Charlie Chaplin, and we all know who Charlie Chaplin was, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, he told me a little story. He told, he told me some wonderful stories. He told me a story about Chaplin. He said, uh, Charlie was living out in uh, in BV, Switzerland. He said, I'm, he asked me to come out and see him. And I came out, came out to see him for a while. So he spent some time with him. And um, so one day they were sitting there on the veranda and they were talking. And Chaplin was bragging, you know, talking about how he, he loved this, he loved that. And he said, and he finally came to, to the fact, he said, I just ate American television. I just ate it. And he went on and on and on about it. And then he, he uh, said, and Buster, what have you been doing lately? And Buster said, television. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of commercials and stuff. He was very, very good at that. But um, anyway, if you'd like, you know, you know, Buster was, he was mayor of Woodland, Woodland Hills. And he was uh, he kind of into the community there. But he told me some wonderful stories about early Hollywood. I'd love to tell you if you'd like to know. Yeah, I would love to hear it. Okay, he said, you know, when they were when they were um, when they were doing films, uh, the company was new and it was in Chicago, in New York. The company, the business was all in New York, and of course, the filming was in Hollywood. He said, and so the people who worked in New York did not know who we were. He didn't know who, who we looked like. 
So he told me a couple of incidents. One, he said, this one guy, a very important executive, was coming out to the uh, audience, to, see, to the studio. And he said, so uh, I talked to Fatty Arbuckle there and Fatty Arbuckle. They were both very funny and, and comedian stuff. And Fatty Arbuckle says, why don't you give him a real ride? And Buster, and Buster said, okay. So Buster, what Buster did was he, uh, he pretended to be the chauffeur. He dressed up as a chauffeur in a, in a beautiful big car. And uh, he, uh, he picked this guy up and uh, he had, and Buster had planned all this out. He got in his car and he planned all these things out, all the spaces. And he was very good about specific little things of, of you know, he'd be parked right here in the car, but go right by him or a train, boom. He, he knew how to, how to place himself. Mm -hmm. so he got in the car with this guy. He walked around. He got in, and boom! He took off like a madman. He was driving all, over, all the sidewalks, every place. Over there. And he finally, he finally comes to this trolley, the trolley. And there's a trolley going that way, a trolley going this way. And he, he comes up and he jams on the brakes halfway be, in, you know, the between the both both trolleys. And and one's coming at him this way, one's coming at this way. And the guy's going nuts. He's going crazy. And so finally, they get him to the studio, and the guy's. The guy, and the guy said, this guy's crazy. He said, I'd like to meet your star, Mr. Keaton. <laughs> and another, another really cute, really great incident. He said, uh, they and, uh, he and Fart had Fatty Arbuckle um, had conspired to have this um, this big Thanksgiving party. And no, it was Christmas. It was Christmas, I think. And, uh, and Fatty Arbuckle had this wonderful, lavish home. And um, so these people came out, and there were about 12 of them. There were a whole bunch of people from New York, and there were producers and all kinds of scenic and everything. And they didn't know who Buster was, so Buster pretended to be the waiter. And so all through the through the, the, the early afternoon, he'd be giving them drinks and everything, and they would never, never even take a look at him. And and so he went to do that. And then, so finally it came time for dinner. So this has all been planned out. So. They all sat down to dinner, big, big table with all these people around. And but and, and Fatty said, all right, ring a little bell. And Buster was in the kitchen. So Buster comes out the door. He's got this beautiful, huge tray of turkey and dressing and vegetables and fruit. And it's just like pile up. He comes in and he goes, boom. Oh! He trips and the thing goes off. <laughs> Somebody says, you son of a... He grabs him and he starts, he drags him into the kitchen and they start throwing pots and pans around, you know, it's scared, they're scared, they're lucky, they're killing a uh, buster. <laughs> and there's a, there's a beat. The door opens, Fatty Arbuckle comes out, opens the door, Buster comes out with another beautiful curry tray. And Fatty Arbuckle goes, gentlemen and lady, I would like you to meet your new star, Buster Keith. <laughs> so that was his introduction and he was so great at that it's like like when he was in new york doing commercials he'd do that commercial where he'd be sitting next to someone and they'd be filming the guy next to him and uh, for instance he had he had one situation where he was a, at a at a, res at a restaurant you know, sitting at the counter and he was eating a bowl of soup and there was a guy sitting next to him and so he was eating his bowl of soup very slow, and suddenly he went, Hug two! Well, he had to put a hairpiece on. The hairpiece was <laughs> right in the soup. <laughs> he looked at it a minute, thought, he picked it up and went, he put it back on. <laughs> 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 and he did, a lot, he did a lot of things like that, where, where he would, they would film him doing something else. But he was just a, he was a marvelous guy. He did, he played a trick on me once when we were coming back from, from the tour. And uh, we had, we played the last night in Los Angeles. And uh, I was playing Dauntless the Drab. He was playing the King and I played his son. So uh, we were, it was the closing night and it was like, I don't know, 11 o'clock or so. And everything was, we just finished. And I was still in my costume and I came into Buster's dressing room. And there was this beautiful girl. Buster said, Sorry, I'd like to meet so and so and such. I said, I said, How are you? And then suddenly I heard a voice behind me. I turned around, it's the same girl. Let's just say, I said, What? It was called the Earl Twins. <laughs> they played a little trick on me there. 
But mm -hmm. uh, it was it was great, and he was uh, he was a great guy. Eleanor Eleanor Keaton was his wife. She had been a dancer, um, in, I think her name was Jean, and she married him at twenty one. Now you know when he um, when he changed his business and he wasn't doing anything on his own again. That was he was very good with when he was doing that. But when he was with the other the big company, I can't remember which one it was, Metro something, and uh, the films weren't successful or very good. So um, he started drinking a lot. And he had a lot, a lot of problems. And Melanor helped put him back together again. She was a great gal. So um, we really, uh, I really had a wonderful time with them. And every time they'd come back to New York, Eleanor and, and Buster, just to visit him or to do a commercial or something, they'd call me up. And Jane and I, Jane, my wife was Jane, beautiful, beautiful girl. We'd go down. It was always Central Park South, looking out at on Central Park. Beautiful hotel. We'd go up there. And I'd go in there and Buster and, and Eleanor would open the door for Jane. And and Buster would be sitting there doing or playing a game he played every time we were in, in the show, you know. And he didn't say anything to me. I just go in there, sit down, and start playing the game. He was so great. But he was uh, he was a very sweet guy. And I was very, very gratified in that. Um, I did a show in London called Divorce Me Darling. I starred in it, go starred in it as a, an answer, Bobby Van Heusen, a terribly rich and uh, attractive American staying at the Negresco. That's what they call it. <laughs> and so uh, I was there and um, doing a show. And uh, we ran about six months and my son was born there. Chuck was born there. And um, toward the end of the rain, uh, I got a, I, I found out from Eleanor that Buster was in the hospital. And he had all kinds of tubes in him. And she said, yeah, he just sat there and pulled all the tubes out. He didn't want to let go. And so he was having a, having problems, and uh, so I sent him a picture of Chuck as a little baby, and he saw it just before he passed. Mm -hmm. So I was very happy about that. And yeah. uh, but he was a very dear guy. He was just so sweet. He just you, you know there wasn't any theater in him. There wasn't any of that. He was just a great great man, and. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of those pictures, films of him where he's doing something, he's carrying something, he falls, mm -hmm. but he's very good at he, that, that's his that's his bit. He does that. You know? mm -hmm. So that's basically right now I'm writing uh, I'm writing um, self-published books. I've got ten. I've got uh, four or five in a series and uh -huh. two in another series. And uh it's gives gives me a full time thing to work because I've got a lot of writing to do. So you gotta publish them. Obviously. What got you uh, into writing from the entertainment business, or is this just an extension of that for you? Writing? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, writing is uh, to me. It's it's it's. I I I feel that the writing uh, is 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 blessed by the fact of my work in theater and the fact that I, I when I write, I write like I talk. Mm -hmm. I've had I've had one one woman say. Oh, you got all these mistakes in there. Well, they're not mistakes. I say didn't, didn't, didn't you know, I say yeah, Y A period dot <laughs> and things like that. And uh -huh. uh, and it, it, it's the way people talk. They don't talk, they don't talk like the people white. They just don't do it. So I try mm -hmm. to write that way. And uh, it's very, very enticing, very it's wonderful. I love it. And uh, because I'm I'm in charge. I can yeah. do anything for those characters. <laughs> They are beating to me, but I, you know what? I'll tell you a real key of writing. There's a book called uh, "The Art of Dramatic Writing" by a guy named Lajos L A J O S Agri E G O I Lajos Lajos Agri, and he says something very important in that. And I read that, and I really, really zapped in on it, and it was that uh, my son just closed the door, and it was that. When you write something, write a character that's strong and has a lot of diversity. Not 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 the diversity you see today, but he said, write something and let the character tell you what the story is. And that would and that's a great great clue. That's what I try to do. And I I will be writing all the time. I'll be writing something. I'll say to myself, No, I I don't I don't know what I should do. And this guy tells me. It just it just comes from because you you should do the character and you have a, a good complete character, and that helps helps you get that way. 
but that's basically um, what I've been doing. And um, I've been, uh, I'm living right now on, on a mountaintop in Texas, it's a little place called uh, Piper, I, I creep, I creep, I creep like a pipe. And, uh, and I'm not driving right now. I just, what, I got a cut cat coming in? <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, I have a cat as are well. Your, are your books based off of, do you write about your experiences in the entertainment industry? No, not really. One, one is about a, a kicker who kicks for the New York Giants, the star kicker, and wow. it's called Kicker. And I have five books with that. I've been working on the last two. And uh, another one is called Death Load, which is a, is a thriller. And um, it's about a guy who, um, in Phoenix, who's a detective. And his um, it, it, the whole story is built on the fact that this gene, this guy that has all these, has, he's a multi-billionaire. And um, he, he makes trucks. He, he's a manufacturer of trucks. And his son is killed by friendly fire in Desert Storm. And he goes, he's a, he's a CIA guy, and he, goes, he gets furious. So he constructs these two huge trucks with all kinds of armament in them. And he sends them across the United States, destroying Air Force bases. And the whole point is to get to the, uh, to the White House. It's very exciting. And mm -hmm. I've got a second book with that called, uh, called Bone Crunch, <laughs> which isn't as bad as it sounds. <laughs> anyway, I want, to build, I want to build a series. The whole idea is to build a series. Mm -hmm. And because the more series you have, the more people read your books. So I'm, that's basically what I'm involved in. I've got a couple of single, uh, what, do they, what do they call them, uh, standalones. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a kid's book called Onions. And it's really a really good book. And um, uh, a couple, of, oh, I've got a boy from Nan, which is a Christian book about, uh, Jesus, about the boy who sees Jesus' transfiguration. On the Mount of Revelation, he has a awesome. bit of his hands clean. Yeah, I'll just clear it up. So anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a lot of different varieties of things. Right now, so uh, that's yeah. really cool. Did you have any inspirations for uh, getting into writing? Uh, did you do any writing when you were in the entertainment business, like either like writing screenplays or you know like scripts or anything yeah, like that? I was, I've written about twelve screenplays. I've had some of them optioned. I've never had one done. Uh, and I have, uh, I have a screenplay now, The Boy from Man, uh, which is, uh, is, there's a great interest from a guy who's a, who does films, but he's got two, two, two things, two films, two things he's going to film before that. And that means it could take, <laughs> take years. But anyway, uh, yeah, I've written a lot of screenplays when I was not, I was kind of following after I, I stopped performing. I wrote with screenplays for about 10 years. And um, that was very interesting and very good. I've got one about a wonderful uh, story called Hot Stuff. It's real. It's based on a real gal in uh, Queens who uh, works in these the, the big rollers, you know, the big rollers that go around in huge, huge machines. And uh, that's a good story because nobody wants, none of the guys wanted to do that. You know, that's, she's in, infringing on their territory. So stuff like that is good. Anything that's controversial. Is very good too for your writing, and, uh, and it's easy to find that stuff too. It's up to it. That's awesome. Uh, out of curiosity, for you, what is um, more important, or where would you rather uh, be in the entertainment field? Is New York a better city for you, or would uh, Hollywood be better for you, personally? Neither one. Neither one. Hollywood. Neither. I never worked in Hollywood. I could have, but I didn't. I didn't play my cards right with that. I had an opportunity. I had a producer come out from Hollywood. He actually came out to see me from Hollywood. And he sat in my apartment in New York. And I had a show called Doris, which was, a, which was Tootsie, before mm -hmm. it became Tootsie. Oh, wow. And they, I think they took it. I think they stole it. Anyway, he said, I want to go produce this with you. I'll, play seven, I'll, I'll get 700000 You get 700000 we'll produce it. Well, I went to, I only had one source, and I went to her, and she didn't want to do anything with it. So I, I, I should have followed through with that. But, uh, you know, I like, I like uh, everything with it. I like the, the theatrical thing, and I like films. I like writing films. It's very yeah. interesting, but it's not, uh, it's not something I'm making a living on right now. Yeah. Do you have any regrets in, 
in terms of not following through with uh, what Hollywood could have brought to your career? Well, I I try not to think about that because it's a negative. But uh, the thing with Joe Manduke, which is what his name was, was the producer that came out. Mm -hmm. I, I keep thinking about if I had done that, I would have probably gone to, when I went to Hollywood, I would have starred in it myself. Because mm -hmm. well, people should have said I should have. He was very big in, in, in New York at that time. The agents and the lawyers, everybody said, this is great. This is great. you got to get this done. This has got to be done. Well, I should have listened to that. And what I should have done is gotten a letter from Joe Manduk, who made his studio. And I should have gone to all the money people. I should have gotten that money. Mm -hmm. I could have gotten it. I, and now I, I'm at the point now. Well, I don't think I have any limits. None. But that's, that's taken me a long time to get there. And now I see why that I, I just uh, stopped myself by fears and stuff and that sort of thing. So you yeah, have that fear, uh, have that uh, re re regret, and the uh, regret about uh, not about Carol Burnett not that calling her on the phone. Uh, that was a really stupid mistake. I had another situation where a producer, I did when I did Howard Keel. Uh, the show of Howard Keel with On a Clear Day, On a Clear Day, down in uh, Florida, at the, at the uh, little playhouse. Of it. Anyway, but anyway, we were down there, and uh, I did a show, uh, did that show with him, and they let me they let me uh, direct it, produce it myself, not not the show, the song that I did. Wait till you're 65. So I did that, and I, I always stop the show every night with it. It was a great, great show. And um, the, the producer of that, Zeb Buffman, called me after the show and he said, Cy, I want you to come out and come down here and do a show with these three, four women and, and you, you'll be the star. I said, oh, okay. And I thought about it. I said, no, I want to, I want to stay here and write. That was a big mistake. So I made, I made some real big mistakes. You know, you got, I've got, now I've got my children's crusade and that's, I'm going for that the full blast. And uh, I know that you can get that down. It's only 14 million. <laughs> would you, um, was what, what was your, what was your favorite theater to perform at? Um, St. James, 44th Street. That's where we did Subways Were Sleeping. It was really a neat, neat theater. I worked at the, I worked at the Alvin Theater on 52nd Street too, but it was kind of cold and I didn't like that. But the St. James was nice. It was, but, but, David Merrick was producing all the shows at that time, and uh, he was in, he was another case to talk about. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I love that theater, and I love the Cherry Lane down down off Broadway. The little theater about about 80, 80, 80 people, I think, seventy or eighty people, and it's doing now. I was reading somewhere where it's doing uh, all kinds of new shows. So, so yeah. <laughs> Good. Did you have a forte whenever you were performing, whether singing, dancing, like all the above? What was your like favorite thing to do? I had an audition that I loved. I just loved it. And I worked on this over a period of 10, 15 years to a, a very simple song called, wait, wait, no, what, what, wait, wait let, me, let me get it right. I'm getting that one. Okay, yeah. da, 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 da. It has a fiddle. Ready for love, I can jump over the moon up above. Fit as a fiddle and ready for one, two, three, four, three. I did that song and I, I developed it over a period of a couple of years. And I would get to a point where I'd tell it, I'd, I'd do a chorus and then I'd do another chorus, I'd stop halfway through, a quarter way through, and tell a joke. Then I'd do a little more dance, I'd do another joke. Mm -hmm. And then I'd do a little dance and I'd get to the ending and I say, and now I'd like to present for your wonderful entertainment pleasure, Buster Keaton's one hour to piccolo player. Have you ever, <laughs> heard, have you ever seen that? No. no. Well, I wish I could do it for you. Anyway, <laughs> then I do that and finish with that. It gets it roars of laughs and laughter that because it's Buster's bit. And I just finish big. And I love doing that number because it's it's like it's like creating order out of chaos to me. Um, you take something like that, and it's just a song, and it's just me with just my stuff, and then I put it all together in a focus, a very strong focus of performing. And that's why I was I was good performing. You know who Fred Ebb was? No, I don't. No, no. 
You heard of the musical Chicago? Yes. yes. Have you heard of I'm packing my shoes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he wrote the lyrics. Fred was, I knew Fred when he was nobody. And he was very, very big. He, he was the biggest, I think the biggest uh, producer, not so much producer, he was a, a writer, uh, mm -hmm. lyrics, music, everything. And he was very big. And he once said, he loved my work. He once said to me, Cy, you don't know how good you are. And I didn't. And I wish I had, because it would have been a lot of things a lot different. Confidence is really important. Confidence yeah. that you can do what you can do and that you can carry it off and that you, uh, people sense that. People sense a sense of lack or a sense of confidence. And if you have that, it's really, really good. And charm helps. Charm is very important. And charm is something you can't teach. For instance, there's a wonderful tap dancer. He did uh, Singing in the Rain on Broadway. I can't remember the name. Really good. But he had no charm. He just didn't have the charm. One of the things Kelly had was charm. He was a very charming man. And that's something you can, if you can develop that somehow, find out how to do it. Good. Anyway, that's that's part of my life, doing all that stuff. Well, you're getting great. So if, you, if you're going to get a role, you, you get the role in, in a performance, typically, how, how long is all the rehearsing and everything go on? Before you guys actually take okay. the performance it's usually, live, uh, it's usually about a month. It's it's, four, it's five days a week for a month. Oh wow! And, yeah, you can get it get it all together that time. I think it's about a month. Um, and um, remember when I first got the show with Buster? I'm trying to remember what exactly. Oh, <laughs> the only thing I remember with the rehearsal with Buster was I went into the John. I think we were down at St. James or something. Like that. I went down to the John. I had a big old lemonade and uh, mm -hmm. orange juice I just got. And I put it down on the sink. I went to the stall. I'm sitting in the stall here. I heard, shh, 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 shh. I said, You're not pouring out my orange juice, are you? <laughs> 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 and there was the orange juice. The, the guy who was who worked there probably, he thought it was uh -huh. a good thing. Anyway, <laughs> that, was, that was the only thing I remember about, the, about that. Oh, and uh, I got to tell you, when we, uh, before you open in a show and, and you're going to get a tour, mm -hmm. what you do is they have they, they have you perform the show for all the uh, performers, Me, all the musicians, everybody, all the musical people. They come to a big show, a big theater, and see you in the show. And uh, Dodie Goodman was the, the gal in this room, uh, the, the part, the uh, gal part, the uh, Carol Burnett part. And uh, so um, <clears throat> there was a scene in this where we all these people, all these theater people are out there. And they're very, you know, they're very receptive. And uh, Dodie was standing far stage now. Everybody else was on stage, and I was dauntless in the drab, her, you know, her, I guess, lover, or whatever. I was far right. And I had this situation where I crossed. I somehow, she was talking or something, and I started crossing, and I started thinking about it. And I, and, and I didn't say anything, but I had an attitude. And I started getting laughs. I get bigger and bigger and bigger. I got the Dodie. And she was furious. <laughs> Man, will you do that to me? I never did that again. But anyway, it, it, it's interesting how people how people um, react sometimes mm -hmm. when they're not that good. It's usually because they're not that good. And, uh, and I think that's big just to some of the big songs. They think they're great, but they're not. Anyway. Uh, Question for you: um, What would what advice would you have to somebody that wants to do this for a living? Like, if this is their dream, um, like what what does it take? Like, you've already mentioned some qualities like believing in yourself and those type of things. But uh, what type of practical, um, you know, logistical things would they need to do to actually take a real shot at this? I know exactly what it is. If you want to be a musical theater performer. Mm -hmm. Or you'll be an actor in a musical theater. Okay. And what you do is you study ballet, you study sh uh, tap, you study acrobatic, you study everything that can be asked to do with your body. Then you take acting lessons and you take all kinds of lessons and you learn and you work. Ballet, take ballet, ballet is basic. Two, I took two classes of ballet a week for two years. 
Now that wasn't a lot because some of these guys are they're amazing and they do it really great. And they, they've been doing it all their life since they were three. And I didn't yeah. do it until I was 21. But that's what you do. You take your, you, you develop this, this is your instrument. You develop this instrument to the nth degree so that when you get to it, you get to a situation where you have an audition. I loved audition because I would take a song. They, they wanted me to do a, a specific song. I would learn the song and I would go over and over. I would over maybe 50, 60, 70 times with the staging, with everything with it. And by the time I got to the audition, or if it's a, if it's a show like uh, on a clear day, by the time I got to the audition, I didn't even, I ignored the fourth wall. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with me. We have our fourth wall, you know, that's the audio. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, uh, that's, that's the way, that's what you do. You work, you hone, you hone it. You don't wait for something to happen to you. You don't wait for the big, big realization. You just know that you work. Your work is in exact relation to what you want to get. So we have a couple segments we like to do towards the end of uh, every podcast. The first one is called No Dumb Questions, uh, in which we take uh, questions from the audience where we, um, you know, on social media, we let them ask questions of our upcoming guests. Yeah, so this right. week, the question is, what's it actually like backstage, you know, whenever, you know, whether that's, you know, on Broadway or even like smaller uh, venues like what, what's it like what's the atmosphere like um you know um is it hectic is is there drama back there like what what was it like backstage well let me tell you it's very simple i'll give you an example with my my, my experience mm -hmm. for instance in uh, on a clear day or um any other show i did i have a dressing room now if i'm a big star i have just myself in the dressing room if I'm a, a, maybe a second ringer, I have two, you know, two people there. Usually I had two people with me. I mean, one person with me and myself. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it was very quiet. No one would come in unless you wanted somebody to come in and talk to you. But there was no activity backstage in reality because people are, should be thinking about their part and what they're doing. They should be focused. They're there to work, they're there to work, not to play games. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's really important to, to realize that when you are backstage, you're, that you're in your spot, you have your dressing room, you put your makeup on, and then once you make, make, make your first entrance or whatever, you stay and you go back to the dressing room. Unless maybe you want to watch the show, which you can do. Uh, sometimes I did that, I watched the show. If I was really solid in my part, I really knew it, and I just knew it back and forth. And I just knew there was no problem with it, and I could let it go. But mostly, it's it's a care. It's it's a situation whereby you uh, you just stay within your center, and you stay in your place. Do you go over your lines and stuff like that as you're getting prepared to go out? Um, you know, is that something That's you're the very, first, your very first line. The, uh, there was a one time I didn't do that. One time in my whole career, I was doing Will Rogers follows. I was doing I was doing his dad. And I got great reviews. I, I love my agent. I had the top agent in New York, Michael uh, Hardick. Michael Hardick. And um, Michael lived out in that area. He came to see me in the show with a friend of his. And um, the show was over. And uh, I, I came back, came down the stairs. And Michael said, Sigh. You're better than you've ever been. You were great. He couldn't have raved more about my work. I thought, oh, that's great. Okay, get me work. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's uh, it was uh, that part was was really interesting. And I was going to tell you that the only time I ever didn't prepare for a scene on stage was in that show. There was one little thing where I would come out and do a little thing with the song. Uh, I just da 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 da. That was all it was, like like 10 seconds. And I came out and I stood and I hadn't prepared for it, but for the first time in my life, and I just stood there. <laughs> People do that sometimes. Buster did it on the road. Mm -hmm. Buster came out once. He uh, he had an entrance, he had a big entrance, and he came out to the front of the stage. He turned around, he couldn't remember it. So he turned around and left. <laughs> so I think it was uh, the dancer there who was, uh, said something. He, he took, he took, a, he filled up the space. 
But that happens sometimes, not very often. That never happened to me except once. Mm -hmm. Uh, our final segment that we normally go into, Sai, is uh, we have to ask, but you do not have to answer. So uh, sometimes it's off the wall, sometimes it's not. This week, the question is, what's the wildest thing that's ever happened in all your years of working in the entertainment industry? The wildest thing? Mm -hmm. The wildest thing? Hmm. I have to think about that because my my whole career has been kind of like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. kind of what I was figuring. <laughs> wow. wow! Well, let me think about that. Um, I remember incidents. I remember this was kind of a wild incident. I was on a tour with Buster on, on, the, on the show we did, um, and uh, Bert Lar. It was also touring at the same time. We were in the same in the same city, and um, so we we got together with Bert after the show. Buster, myself, and Bert, a few people, and we were sitting there. And um, there was a young man who was, I think, he was in high school, and he was working for the, the local newspaper. And he was a sweet kid, sweet kid, and and. Um, uh, it, it, what was really weird was was Bert Lahr was so angry, so mad at it, so angry with it, and I just thought that's so unnecessary. This is an innocent little kid; he doesn't know what he's doing. He's just working for the paper to make a couple of bucks. And I thought, how bad that was. that was a bad, bad thing for him to do. No, I, it may I, I, I can't say um, that it, he wasn't it wasn't worth it, but. He did the funniest, Bert Lahr did the funniest thing I've ever seen on Broadway, everything. He was doing Foxy, and he was in, a, it was an outside, and, 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 and an outside situation. And he suddenly, this bear came out of it, and he screamed, and he ran down to the right, the stage right down to the corner, and he went up the stage, went all the way up to the stage. So they had, so they had a little elevator back there. He put his foot on it, and he looked like he was climbing. Yeah. He laughed for 15 minutes. <laughs> and he, I told his wife that she was going to his, my church, and I said, "Your your your husband is really one funny man." And uh, he was he was just great. So I, that's as crazy as I can get. I can't think of anything really mm -hmm. nuts nuts for me. If I do, I'll mail you. <laughs> uh, Michael, do you have any questions for uh, Sai before we let him go today? I have one last question. Okay, Michael. With the name Cy Young, do you plan on writing any books about baseball? <laughs> I did. It's called. Oh, I heard you, you wrote right. Okay, Excellent. I wrote one, and uh, it's called "The Kings of October." And the fact glad you brought that up. "The Kings of October" is about the uh, year nineteen three, the first World Series, in which the Boston Americans—they're called now the Red Sox—it's called the mm -hmm. Boston Americans. Played the uh, played the who was it? They played uh, uh, Louisville or someone. And uh, John Wayne was interested in, it. and I got him this script, and uh, to the production company I can't remember his name, but I got like they wanted ten scripts. I got them ten scripts because there was a great part in him for Jimmy Collins. Jimmy Collins was a great third baseman, and and he was uh, he was a coach. He was the coach of the, of the team. And uh, it was a very interesting situation because you should look into that, look into that sometime. The first World Series, uh, the first World Series in 1903, and it was all it was all kind of fighting and going back and forth, and everybody was having a problem with. They didn't want them to be there. They didn't want this new team to be there, so they they, they set the the, uh, the stadium on fire. They did some crazy things. It was fun. It was silly. Mm. Excellent. I'll look at that. Yeah, yeah but I have had trouble with as a writer, I'm calling myself Cy Young. I have to say Cy Young author. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I think I'm a baseball player. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that is pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Cy, I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, I appreciate all so these much. awesome stories you've shared with us. Uh, where can people find your books and where can people follow you? Okay, CyYoungBooks.com. C-Y-Y-O-U-N-G-B-O-O-K-S dot com. 
and everything's on there, including my musical, my children's crusade. All the songs are on there. You can listen to the songs. They're, they're, they're CDs, um, and uh, you can have you can look up my, my everything I've got there is on is on that uh, on that uh, situation. There. So uh, yeah, it's it's fun. It's fine. That's I would say that's the best way. CyYoungBooks.com. Awesome. Excellent. So guys, if you could check out his website, we'd appreciate that. Also, uh, make sure you go over to Huddle Card Collection and check out Michael's channel. He does have another podcast he does over there called Collecting Profit every single Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, where he talks about sports cards, collectibles, and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, if you're interested in seeing this in video format, it's going to be uploaded to Pittsburgh, which is my YouTube channel. And there's also weekly vlogs I put out with my girlfriend where we go fun places and we like to travel and do stuff like that. So hey. into that, come over to Pittsburgh. Uh, okay. Until the next podcast, guys, we appreciate you watching. May God bless you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys are great. Thank you, Cy. This has been Thank wonderful. You, Thank you.